one of the big challenges for us in the film was to um, bridge the gap between the fully animated characters that we were going to create and then the live action characters that we were going to shoot. And this was really important to Tim Burton, um, that there was some sort of visual glue to bind those two worlds together. And by that I mean we would take the CG characters and try to make them a little more lifelike in terms of their rendering, their hair, things like that. But we were going to take the live action characters and make them a little bit more characterized and help bridge that gap. Because of all this digital manipulation we we're going to do with the photography, we knew that we just couldn't take um, an HD camera and just blow that material up 100%. You know, you're pushing it when you go 15, 20%. So we knew we had to go to a, a 4K digital camera. And the reason why we went digital is because um, when we were on set, we wanted to be able to pre-visualize everything in real time on set. And that meant we needed real-time camera tracking systems on set. We had a couple of those. And uh, um, you could, obviously couldn't do that with a, with a tap, video tap coming out of a film camera, so we needed to go digital. So this is a, a 4K frame. We actually opted for the DALSA Evolution camera, which is a 4K image. And in comparison, you can see what an HD frame is in terms of size. If you can imagine taking the Red Queen's head from the 4K frame, sliding it on over and placing it back on the shoulders of the HD frame, that's essentially the paradigm and, 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 and the techniques we use throughout the film to do our scaling. So this is an example of a shot in the movie that we scaled. You can see that um, first step, obviously shoot the, the background plate, or the foreground plate in this case. And this is the Red Queen here, normal, normal head, normal waist. If you can imagine that being the 4K frame that we started with, we would then go through the work of warping her neck, shrinking that down, and then extracting her whole head and neck from her shoulders and then taking that material and placing it back onto the lower reduced image of the HD frame that we created from the 4K frame. And eventually we would tuck in her waist. And then you can see that by us scaling the head up, now we're changing the, the framing, the headroom that was shot in the photography. And as a DP, going through this scenario when we were shooting the movie, we worked with Darius Walski, who's the director of photography for all the Pirates of the Caribbean films. Um, he's like, well, you know, we don't know how big her head's going to be. How can I shoot these close-ups? You know, how, how do I know how much headroom to leave? He's like, I can't shoot a movie like this. He's like, you know, we're gonna have, I'm going to have to shoot what I see, and you guys take care of it later. So we knew that was going to be an important uh, thing that we had to rebuild into our tool set, the ability to change framing. But we knew that we were going to be changing head sizes throughout the film, and so that, of course, changed the framing. So we couldn't wait to do our match moves after everything was figured out, because we would never finish the movie. So basically we came up with a system I call the Recompose system, which allowed us to reframe the photography and take all that data that we reframed in 2D and apply it in the film back of Maya, which is our 3D package that we use to do our layout. And therefore, we were able to, make, we were able to match move on all the original um, photography and without having to go back and do anything. We could change the framing any time we wanted to and it wouldn't affect the rest of our work. You can see we do a little cleanup here. This is the final we call the pre-comp. And this would get fed down the line to the final compositors for them to integrate into the background. I'll show you a quick clip here. Keep in mind, the background characters were not there when we photographed this, so that was a huge part of our work. So you can see we would start by shooting the right queen, like I, like I mentioned. We would go through and do a quick composite where we did the, the blow up of the head and the reframe of the photography here. Then once that was approved, we would go back and re-finesse all that, do the warping. And then we had to integrate these cordiers later on. So we, know, we didn't know what takes we were going to use when we were shooting, so we had to come up with ways to shoot things and make them flexible so they could work for a number of plates. And we decided to shoot these cordiers as locked off elements for a lot of it. And with a number of camera projection techniques in Nuke, we were able to put these uh, uh, characters right back into the shots. And we didn't have to go through the process of cutting all the characters off and putting them all on individual cards or pieces of geometry. We were able to do that in, in big groups um, because some of the tools that we created in Nuke. We would do our rough layout of our environment. And then we would do our character blocking to get the framing and to kind of figure out what characters would go in. 
and then we would animate. And while this is going on, we're doing a whole depth layout process as well in stereo to create the stereo. So we were doing the stereo kind of in, in uh, the same, at the same time we were doing the actual shots. You can just see this is just the character build of some of the elements going into place. So what I'd like to do now is like take you into Nuke and show you some of the actual tools and some of the techniques that we used uh, to do this work. I'm going to start with uh, one of the principal things that was important for us was the Mad Hatter enlargement of these, of these eyes. You can see we started with one of these green screens. So this is the original green screen plate. This is with the Hatter's eyes unaffected. And again, we used the uh, Generate Sapphire plugin uh, to do this eye effects. And we, you know, for me, it was really important you know, you have these great flexible tools uh, in Nuke and especially in the Sapphire plugins. And there's so many controls, you can do so many different things. And when you're doing a show like this where you have hundreds and hundreds of shots you have to do, you have to be consistent in some way. So the nice thing about Gizmos in Nuke is that you can take the features and, and knobs and handles that you like in your favorite tool and limit those to the artist. So there's only certain ones that they are able to use. And then you can reformat those and specifically label them so they are very specific to the task at hand. So what we would do for the Mad Hatter, we'd start, we'd go in and do a one-point track for each of his eyes. You can see that is here. And then after that, we would go through and just attach a little bezier, a little garbage mask to his eyes that would track through the shot. And we would do that for both eyes. And our end result would be, we, we would pull up our nuke tool that we created. In this case, it's called the Mad Hatter's Eye Enlarge. And it basically, I, I created it so we had three control, three, um, inputs available. One is the Mad Hatter foreground, which you would connect to the plate. One is the left eye mat, which you would, you, you would connect to the eye mat for the left eye. And the last one would be the right eye mat that you would connect to the right eye mask. And then if you just look at the results of that gizmo, there it is. So right out of the box, we had something that was <clears throat> pretty close. Of course, it would vary based on how, how big or large Hatter was in the frame. But we left enough controls available to the artist. You can see I have a right eye control here, which can make the eye smaller or larger. And then I also had controls to vary the width and height of each eye. The width and the height. <clears throat> so basically we had a lot of flexibility there. And then I built in some other controls that we were able to control how those eyes blend into the head and they would also control the alpha channels. Because as you can see, the Mad Hatter has green eyes, and we shot on a green screen. So those mats were very important downstream, so when we did our spool suppression, we were able to maintain the green and the green makeup in his contacts and his eyes. We also built controls in there to sharpen the photography so we could, since we were blowing it up, we could you know, increase the sharpness if we needed to to maintain the image quality. And then we added some controls that we could turn the effect on or off. So when Hatter turned around, we didn't have to go through the expense of processing something that we're not seeing. And then again, Using EXR format, we were able to output the many mats that we would need. In this case, we would out output the original mats that blended the eyes back into the head. We would output the mats that we created that were nice and sharp. And then we would output an alpha channel for the Hatter's chair or for the, the, the um, Hatter in general or the scene. Because this would allow us to go to the next phase of our process, which was doing our, our depth layout and our layout of the scene. And so that would go downstream to our layout artists, and they would lay in the background. And because of the way we set this pipeline up, when the backgrounds were created for this layout process, we didn't have to go through and send it back to a compositor and have a compositor now lay in the green screens or a background. That was all automated. That was all part of the process. We would embed the correct alpha channels into, into the EXR files from Nuke, and Maya would just know exactly what to do with those things. <clears throat> 